watched him do great miracles. I saw him raise the dead. He said he was the promised one by our fathers prophesied. But then he climbed up Calvary and there. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. Daniel did his part. Now we'll see if I can do mine. I, I've come to the conclusion that some of the hem writers are smarter than some of the theologians um, because some of these hems just have such rich messages. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. We'll ask that you would take your word and work it into our hearts. I pray that you'd give me clarity of thought and mind and understanding. I pray that the words that I speak would be only pleasing to you. And we'll ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Continue to pray for Sherry Deckert. And continue. I got a call from the... Or Renee got a call from the Mays this morning. And the Mays are sick too. So if you could remember them in prayer. Um, Sherry, I don't have an update on Sherry, but um, I know she was sick. She has COVID, and the Mays also are sick. So if you could remember them all in prayer. If you could take your Bibles. We're going to start in John chapter 1. And I, I got this message from the Baptist bread. You might think that's strange, but... Um, if, if you want to know how this whole thing got started, you can read Thursday, February 25th, February 25th, uh, the risen Lord, me and 
Dennis May had a conversation about that uh, in the foyer one morning whenever we were ushering. And uh, I started thinking about it after our conversation and then the pastor said he'd be gone and Kevin would be gone and, and you know, they had to go down pretty far in the roster because everybody else is gone. So, uh, and then during this time, my boys and I had a conversation about this also. And so I wanna br bring to you today's resurrection day. The day we celebrate on our calendar is Resurrection Day. Some call it Easter. You don't hurt my feelings if you call it Easter. I know what it is. It's, it's what our calendar says it is. What we need to make sure we understand is when we celebrate Thanksgiving on our calendar, what are we celebrating? Is it just the turkey? It's God, right? You are the smartest person in the congregation this morning. Exactly. It isn't just our material goods. No, there's more to the story. When we come to Christmas, what are we celebrating? Exactly. God. Yes, we put an emphasis on his birth, but what are we focusing on? There's more to the story of Christ than just his birth. And when we come to Easter or Resurrection Day, if we were to just focus on the, the resurrection of Jesus and not what happened three days prior, I think we wouldn't be telling the whole story. And what happened between his incarnation and his death and his burial and res his resurrection, his ascension, what, what happened in that? So today I'm going to try to give you a little whirlwind tour of what the story of redemption encompasses. And I, I know I'm talking to people this morning who I should not have to explain what Christmas is and what Easter is and what a lot of things are in the Bible because when I look around the room, many of you are people that have been in church for an awful long time. So um, I am going to skip through this a little bit, assuming that you know what I'm talking about. And I'll, when I get there, I'll tell you what I mean. But when I, when I come to John chapter 1, And it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 1. And the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. I want us all to be on the same starting point. We have God, the triune Godhead. Made up of three parts, but one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in John chapter 1 that God, the Word, Jesus, part of the triune Godhead, always was, always is, always will be. He's the same person that said, I am the Alpha and Omega. It's the same person. Starting in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, you're introduced Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, you're introduced to Jesus Christ, the Word of God. All the way through the book of Malachi, when the Old Testament ends, and all these pictures and prophecies of the Messiah are written down. And even at the end of Malachi, it says, the Son of Righteousness will come. All about Christ. The whole Old Testament. In fact, when, when Jesus rose from the dead and he met those people on the road to Emmaus, what, what did he do? He, he took the scriptures. What was it? It wasn't the book of Revelation. 
It was the Old Testament. And he showed to them and explained to them who he was through the Old Testament. The Bible focus through the whole Old Testament and the New Testament is all Jesus Christ. I want you to understand, I want you to keep in your mind, if you're taking notes, you can write this down, that the Word of God always was and always will be, and He was, the Bible says, He was the Creator God, and He made all things. There wasn't anything that was made that He didn't make, and when you come down to verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So now we have the implementation of the plan of salvation that the Bible says was planned out before the foundations of the world were laid. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the fall of man, after Adam and Eve sinned and, and death and the curse passed upon all men, and that first Adam passed death and the curse unto all men, so now, that, that now the wages of sin and the curse of sin is death. Genesis chapter 3, 15, the third chapter of the Bible already promises that there will come a Redeemer, a second Adam, that will crush Satan's head. And as you go through the Old Testament and you look at stories like Abraham sacrificing Isaac and Abraham saying, God will provide himself a lamb. Or you look at stories like Noah building the ark and the ark sitting there with the door open and Noah preaching righteousness and saying, come in to the ark and be saved. And everybody just went, Pff. And what a picture that door into the ark is of Jesus Christ. The Passover lamb, the sacrificial system. I don't care where you go in the Old Testament, you're going to see Jesus if you look for him. The Word was made flesh. Remember that. God, one part of the triune Godhead, was made flesh. The plan of redemption is being implemented. When we come to Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 35, and this is, we focus a little bit on this at Christmas time. It says, and the angel said unto her, to Mary, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Well, think of Mary's response. It tells us what a response is in verse 34. It says, And Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered her, and here's what he answered, and I think this is a very important verse for us to keep in mind. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Who's the Holy Ghost? One third of the triune Godhead. You got the Word becoming flesh. You got one third of the triune Godhead, the Holy Ghost, that makes up the Godhead, the one God in three parts. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, Mary, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. The power of God Almighty is going to overshadow thee. That's a pretty powerful statement. The power of God Almighty is going to overshadow thee, Mary. Think about it. Let that sink in for a minute. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I want you to remember that word, holy thing. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That holy thing. That baby that's going to be born of you is going to be a holy thing. It's birth. 
its conception is miraculous. There's no two ways to, to, to talk about it. It's miraculous. If you don't think it's miraculous, you're denying Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 35. And in verse 37, it says, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing. You're going to believe that God can literally, Jesus Christ can literally speak the worlds and the universe. Oh, and by the way, he made the stars also into existence, but he don't have the power to bring forth a redeemer. He certainly does. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5 says, But when the fullness of time was come, when the exact moment in time that God had planned, the Bible says, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of son. I submit to you this morning that when that verse says, And God sent forth his son, God sent forth his incorruptible seed. God sent forth his incorruptible seed. The Holy Ghost came upon her. The power of Almighty God overshadowed her. And that thing that's going to be born of you, Mary, is going to be a holy thing. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 says, For then, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Talking about Jesus Christ becoming flesh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. All will go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3.15. There it is. Boom. Jesus is going to destroy death. That is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels... But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. A lot of times we have a notion to just skim over that little verse right there and not really think too deeply into it. But it says that he took on flesh like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Jesus Christ, and we'll further this, this point as we go on, but Jesus Christ is a faithful high priest. He's not only a faithful high priest, but he's a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the people. He completely fulfilled the office of high priest. He didn't stop short. He didn't say, oh, I, I'm going to bring a giraffe in to sacrifice. You know, the high priest did that. He'd be dead. If the high priest said, oh, I'm, I, you know what? I don't feel like bringing the hot coals of fire I'll, I'll, or the incense in to cover the mercy seat before I go in. You know, I'll, I'll just bring the blood of the lamb in. He would have been dead. Jesus Christ faithfully fulfilled the office of high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the people. The next thing I want to talk about it when I'm still focusing on Christ's birth is, I told Josh I was going to speak a little bit about biology this morning because he told me how much he loved biology and how he can't wait to learn biology in school and chemistry and all these different things. So I said, oh, good. I said, we'll be talking a little bit about biology this morning in the service. You didn't know that, did you, there, Sonia? <laughs> did you know that when a baby is born inside of a, a woman, that the mother and baby's blood never mixes? It does not mix. They're separate. Did you know the baby's blood does not form until the egg gets fertilized by the male part? 
When the egg gets fertilized, then the blood forms, then the baby forms and grows. But the baby's blood and the mother's blood never mix. They never mix. What's my point? I raise chickens. When I go out and grab a chicken's egg, that chicken will never hatch into another chicken unless I introduce a rooster into my flock. Impossible. I told the teens on Wednesday night, this is the best 100% the best guaranteed form of birth control that there is. It's guaranteed. Never introduce a rooster into your flock. Guaranteed. What's my point? My point is, Jesus did not have an earthly father. See, the Holy Ghost came upon Mary, and the power of the Almighty overshadowed her. And this thing that be born of Mary Sorry, Jim. I came unhooked. And I don't know where the little clipper went. No problem. We'll just get rid of that. See yeah, that Satan can't get you one way, he'll try to do the other, but it's he's defeated. Jesus' blood formed in Mary after the Holy Ghost came upon her. I'm going to tell you this morning, I believe with all my heart, that Jesus' blood was special. It was holy. It was incorruptible. He didn't inherit a sin nature from his father. His father was the Holy Ghost. His blood never mixed with this sin-cursed mother. No, it did not. His blood is holy. In Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Well, who's the holy one? The one that we just talked about in Luke just a little while ago. Mary, that one that's going to be born of you is going to be a holy thing. I will not allow my holy one to see corruption, God says. Jesus will not see corrupt corruption. And then Peter, after the resurrection in Acts 2.27, he's preaching salvation. He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the empty tomb to the people and in Acts 2.27, he repeats it again. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. No, Jesus would not see corruption. And I, I submit to you this morning that day, it isn't not only his body and his bones, but it's his blood also. Well, what makes me say that? Because, I, you know, you might not be able to deduce that based on what I have just said. Well, if you turn to 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, this is what it says. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Okay, I'm not, so, you know, I got to repeat these things to myself as I read them. I'm not redeemed with corruptible things. Okay such as silver and gold, from my vain lifestyle, received from addition from my fathers. Okay, I got that. Well, what, I, what am I? What incorruptible thing am I redeemed with? Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ. Oh, you're not redeemed with corruptible things. You're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. 
who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. That this plan was implemented before the foundations of the world was ever laid. God knew when he created man that man would fall. Don't ask me to explain why he did that because I do not know. When you come down to verse 23, it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. That's why I said, when I go back to Galatians chapter 4, that's why I said, God sent his son. When the fullness of time was come, God sent his son. I said, incorruptible seed. God sent his incorruptible seed. Why do I say that? Because I try to look at all these things as a whole. And it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. By what? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. A lot of times we want to horn the Bible into saying, this is what he's talking about right here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word. We're born again by the, yes, the written Word of God, but we're also born again because of what the living Word of God did for us. It's, you cannot separate them apart which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Corinthians 15.1 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and the, he, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Well, you know, we always say that's the gospel in a nutshell. Well, what does it mean when it says, according to the scriptures? And again, it says, according to the scriptures. Well, let, let's look at a little bit of that. Because when we are here today in 2021 celebrating Easter, you know, we're going to have our ham and ravioli, whatever we're going to have for lunch today. You know, I want to make sure that we don't just focus on, yes, Christ ascended. Yes, he had victory over death. Yes. That isn't the whole story. Let's look at the whole story, because what happened in the last three days prior to his ascension is, is amazing. I'm not going to read every little bit of this, because I think you all know, when I tell you what it is, what I'm talking about. But when you look, when I said a little while ago that the Old Testament was full of, of pictures of Jesus Christ, one of the things I was talking about was the Passover. And if, if you were to look at Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 through 14, you'd learn all about the Passover and whenever God was going to deliver the, the Israelites from Egypt. And we get to that last plague, and this, this is what he tells the nation of Israel to do. God says to Moses, Speak unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month you shall take a lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Verse 6, you'll keep it to the 14th day, then you'll kill it. Verse 7, you'll take of the blood, you'll strike it upon the two, two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. Verse 11 says, it is the Lord's Passover. Verse 13 says, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Verse 21, Moses called for the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover, and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. We have all sat through many Seder meals. And we see the picture of Jesus through the whole Seder meal from they were instructed to clean the leaven out of their house. They were instructed to get a blemishless lamb. They were instructed to watch it. They were instructed to make sure it didn't have any deformities or, or lameness and, and was without spot. And on the 14th day, they were to kill it. And they were to, so the, all these pictures throughout the whole Passover meal, uh, and it all points to Jesus Christ. Even the act of striking the lintel and the two doorposts with the basin at the bottom is a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ having his 
crown of thorns on his head and his pierced hands and his pierced feet at the bottom. It's, it's all a picture. All of it's a picture. You cannot take the picture out of the scriptures. I would love to have been on the road to Emmaus to hear exactly what Jesus said to those people on the road to Emmaus. I'm curious if he would have talked about the Passover lamb. John 1, 29 and 36, John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, well, says, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold, the Lamb of God. And in John 1, 29, it says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. You see, John was the, was the forerunner, the foreteller that the Messiah was coming. And when he saw Jesus, what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Here is your Passover, your perfect Passover lamb, the promised Messiah from all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. The one that the Old Testament always pointed to. Exodus 34, verse 25 says, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. Well, what does it say in the New Testament? What's the New Testament picture of that? 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Get rid of the leaven out of your house. Because Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. It's all the Old Testament constantly pointing to Christ in the New Testament. If you fast forward to Leviticus chapter 16, you'll learn all about the tabernacle. What was in the tabernacle and and what the priest was supposed to do when he was supposed to make an atonement for the nation of Israel. And it talks, and I, I don't have time to go through it, but I assume that you all know this. It talks about him killing the bullock for himself. You see, because first he had to make a sacrifice for himself to consecrate himself because he was the high priest. He was the only person that could do the sacrifice, but he couldn't do it unless he was consecrated and clean before God. He could not do it. So what did he have to do? He had to offer a bull for himself. He had to take incense and bring it into the veil with the blood of the bull. And he had to apply the blood of the bull to the mercy seat for his own sins. Then they had two goats. The one goat they would sacrifice and do the same thing over. And the second goat they would leave alive and Aaron would confess the sins of the nation upon that live goat and send it off to it says a place uninhabited again a picture of Jesus Christ alive separating my sins as far as the east is from the west it's it's all a picture and and the application of that blood is all a picture of what Christ was going to do it goes on to say in verse 17, there should be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement into the holy place until he comes out and have made an atonement for himself and for this household and for the congregation of Israel. He couldn't be around people. They had specific rules, garb. He was consecrated. He had to stay that way. He couldn't have anybody around him, be mulling around with a bunch of people. No, he had to stay pure and clean and go into the Holy of Holies once a year with the blood for the people. And it talks about putting the, you know, he'd sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times and then the horns of the altar and all these different things. All to picture what Christ was going to do in the New Testament that we celebrate this weekend. In Mark 15, 38, it says, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. When Christ died on the cross. 
Hebrews 10, 19 says that we now have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. All a picture of the access I now, I can now have boldness to enter the Holy of Holies. Why? Because of what Christ did for me and the transaction that he accomplished. Hebrews chapter 9 is critical to the whole scenario. If, if you don't read anything, read Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 is the crux of the whole thing. And I want to focus a little bit of time there. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 2 says, For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. This is all talking about the earthly tabernacle in the Old Testament. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it with the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, and not without blood. So it's, the story is being repeated again in the book of Hebrews to explain to us what was done and now how Christ fulfills this. Which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people, the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances and imposed on them until the time of reformation. Sorry for reading that so fast, but I was screaming to get to verse 11. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come. You know, Christ was of the tribe of Judah. You all know that. He was not of the tribe of Levi. Well, how was he a priest? He's a better priest. You know, he, he is after the order of Melchizedek. He is a priest that lives forever to make intercession for me. His priesthood will never end. He will never die. Like the Old Testament priest, Aaron died. And then the next one in line died. And the next one in line died. Jesus will never die. He has an unchanging unending priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. He's a better high priest. His, his blood is better. His sacrifice is better. The tabernacle is better. Everything is better. This was the plan. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. What does that mean? by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. There is a tabernacle in heaven. There is a tabernacle in heaven. Not made with hands. And the tabernacle in the Old Testament is a pattern. God gave Moses the pattern of the heavenly to make on earth. the more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. I have that word, he entered, highlighted in my Bible. He entered. Make sure you understand the fact that he entered once into the holy place where the heavenly mercy seat is with his blood, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conference, conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Did you know that if you look up your Strong's Concordance, and you look up the word blood in the Strong's Concordance, it's number 129. Did you know the word 129 is the same word from Matthew to Revelation? There's only two exceptions. It's the same word, 129 in the Strong's. Blood, literally, it means blood, human or animal. The two exceptions are the lady that had the issue of blood, and if you read the, the word, that's what it means. She had a problem with the flowing blood. The other exception is right here. This is the other exception. It's like 129, 130, and 131. This word here means effusion of blood. I have butchered all kinds of animals in my short life. And I know what an effusion of blood looks like, and I know what it means to sacrifice an animal. And when I sacrifice that animal, when I kill that animal, the purpose is to drain the blood. And this word here is, the, is one of the two exceptions of the word blood from Matthew to Revelation. An effusion of blood, a flowing of blood, a draining of blood is the, is the definition. But everywhere else, the word blood is blood. If I had a knife up here and I cut my wrist and I was bleeding in front of you, that's what they're talking about. Blood. It's blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It was therefore necessary, now get this, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. What is he talking about? The Old Testament tabernacle. The Old Testament way of doing things. The, the priest. All that was patterned after what God showed Moses. And it all had to be purified with blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And these patterns of things in the heavens, things in the heavens, you mean to tell me the things that were being sprinkled with blood here on earth is in the heaven? That's exactly what I'm telling you. It's in the heaven. These things on earth that they were doing in the Old Testament that portrayed what Christ was going to do in the New Testament was a pattern of what is in the heavens and what was going to be done. The pattern of things in the heaven should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves, the ones that are in the heavens, with better sacrifices than these. Well, what's the better sacrifices? Jesus Christ's blood? Jesus Christ's sacrifice? God? Hmm. You are much more smarter than the adults are. <laughs> For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands. No. Christ, when he was sacrificed himself on the cross and died and the veil was rent and he was buried and he rose again, which we celebrate this weekend, he didn't enter into the holy of holies in the tabernacle, the Old Testament tabernacle, even though they were in an Old Testament economy at this time for a short period of time more. But... No. Where did he go? He's, he didn't go into the holy place made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. For yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared, should underline that in your Bible if you don't, 
he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Numbers chapter 7, verse 89, it is the story of Moses was gone to the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, and then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony, from between the two cherubims, and he spake unto him. Well, guess what John saw? I'm glad you asked. Revelation 11, 19. This is what John saw. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. You see, the things on earth are patterned after the true. The things on earth are patterned after what's in heaven. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says, Seeing we have such a great high priest, verse 16, we can come boldly into the throne of grace. I told you a minute ago that the priest had to go alone. He couldn't be corrupted. There was a, there was a, a procedure that he had to do and he could not be around people. We watched uh, J Jesus Friday night, Sight and Sound Theater, put it on TV. And my only really critique that I have of that play is this. Because I believe that everything in the Old Testament perfectly portrays what Jesus was going to do in the New. And, and if you were to look at John chapter 20, verse 16, this is what it says. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turneth herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father and to your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples. In that play, they portrayed Jesus resurrecting, coming out of the tomb, showing himself to Mary, and M Mary is, is all over him. I have a problem with that. Because the Bible says, touch me not. You know what that word touch me says? If you look it up in the Strong's Concordance? It's the same exact word that is used that says, if I may just touch the hem of his garment, I could be healed. It is not good for a man to touch a woman, same word. And the list goes on and on. No. Jesus Christ, our high, high priest, who would fulfill the high priestly function in the New Testament for us, one time for all, when he ascended, was on his way to heaven into the true tabernacle with his blood to apply to the mercy seat for us as a one-time sacrifice forever, never to have to be done again. And therefore, he said to Mary, don't touch me. I really don't understand where people would say that means something different. Because when Jesus says, don't touch me, I think he meant, don't touch me. It's not like your children, when you tell them 14 times to do the same thing, and then really the 15th time is when you really meet it. No. It's, don't touch me. And I believe she didn't touch him. I just take the word for what it says. Why do I say that? Because he was going to fulfill the priestly function of the high priest. He couldn't be touched. He, he couldn't be corrupted before he went into the Holy of Holies. Don't touch me. I have a, I have a, a plan and a purpose to accomplish. Because if you read down further in the chapter, in verse 19 it says, then that same evening, that same day, what was Jesus just going on a... On a, a I, I'll just go up to heaven and, and visit my father for a moment, then come back down. That, that's absurd. No, 
He was going to heaven for a purpose, and that was to apply his blood to the heavenly mercy seat, because later that same evening, in verse 19, it says, being the first day of the week, the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst. I have the doors were shut underlined. How did he get in? The doors were shut. When you read the account in Luke chapter 24, he says to them, Behold my hands and my feet. This is right after the road to Emmaus, and he shows himself to them. Well, what does he say? A completely different story than he says to Mary Magdalene. Now what does he say? Handle me. See me. See my fingers and my side. Thomas, put your hand into it. Handle me. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. I do think it's interesting that he didn't say flesh and blood. He said flesh and bones. Because the Bible says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I think that's interesting. Where was his blood? Hmm. You get down to verse 43. These are all the words which I spake unto you while I was with you. That all, this is a very important thing to have underlined in your Bible, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. When you read Isaiah 53, you cannot help but see Christ. When you read Psalm 22, you cannot help but see Christ. You cannot help it. It's as plain, I mean, it's as plain as, as can be. Hebrews chapter 8 says, Who serve unto the example of a shadow of heavenly things. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Hebrews 10.1 says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, can never make with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually the comers thereunto perfect. You roll down to verse 12, it says, But this man, Jesus Christ, that holy thing that would be born of Mary, the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. I have in my Bible the word full sacrifice. He made one sacrifice Four sins forever, and he sat down on the right hand of God. Meaning, he just didn't die. He just didn't rise. He just wasn't born. No. It was all. Full sacrifice. The spotless Lamb of God was sacrificed. His blood was spilt. The veil was rent. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, just like the Old Testament says. He rose again, crushing Satan's head, and then ascends to heaven to apply the blood to the mercy seat as a faithful high priest for us. It was a completed full sacrifice. There wasn't one part missing. Remember, he was a faithful high priest. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews is just chucked full of, of this. Verse 21, verse chapter 7. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 24. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Verse 26. For such an high priest became us again, Here's the, here's the words. Who is holy, who is harmless, who is undefiled, who is separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. In closing, just let me read you some, some verses. Because... What's my purpose in telling you all this this morning? My purpose in telling you all this this morning is, here we are, Easter, Resurrection Day 2021. 
Don't get lazy. Don't parcel out the plan of redemption. I looked at the teens the other night, and I, here's what I said to them a month ago. I have a list of a lot of you all who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ because either in vacation Bible school or, or wherever, you have made a profession of knowing Christ as your Savior. But where are you? What are you doing? Where's your testimony? There's only a handful here. Maybe we do a disservice to people by not fully explaining to them the implications of Christ's sacrifice. And maybe we set people up with a false pretense that they know God is their Savior, and maybe they don't. Oh, just repeat this prayer, little Johnny, and you won't go to hell. And little Johnny repeats that prayer because he don't want to go to hell. Doesn't have a clue. And grows up and... Nothing. Let's think of the importance, not only of the fulfilledness, the fulfilled picture and prophecy of Christ. You know, what was our condition? What was, what was the solution? The incarnation, the birth of Christ, and the, and the, the death of Christ, and the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ and the, and the burying of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ and the sitting down of Christ. And it all is of such importance. Heaven help us not to forget and to just focus on, oh, today's Easter. We're only going to focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, he arose. Yeah, he arose, but there's a whole lot more to the story than he arose. Because if I take the first part of the way, the second part is of no, no value. If I take the second part away, the first part's of no value. I, I mean, <laughs> and I can tell the whole story from beginning to end perfectly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Good, good starting point, right? I could tell him the whole entire story from there. Guess what the next verse says? And this is the condemnation. God didn't come into the world to condemn the world. No, he came to the world to save the world. This is the condemnation. That light came and men loved darkness rather than light. They rejected him. I can tell the story. I can tell the truth of God's word. And people will still reject. I cannot help that. But let's be ones who tell the story accurately. And let's try to make sure people understand it. First John 1 John 7. But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 5.9, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Revelation 
says they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12.10 says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That accuser of the brethren. How did they overcome him? By the blood of the Lamb. He's defeated. His head is crushed. Christ's perfect sacrifice was accepted by God Almighty. And Satan is defeated. We can... We can be so, we, we should be bouncing out of here, right? Tigger, bouncing out of the church. We're so excited, right? <laughs> that got a reaction. <laughs> Revelation 19, 13 says he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. I'm just going to tell you again, the word blood in the Strong's 129, is the same word from Matthew to Revelation with two exceptions. Unless you get comfortable, let me give you a warning. And I'll close here. Hebrews 10.29 says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye Shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing? God is coming again. Yeah. He, it says in that verse, There's going to be a sore punishment for anybody who calls the blood of Jesus an uncommon thing. An unholy thing is the exact word. Mary, this thing that's going to be born of you is a holy thing. His blood is never going to mix with Mary's. You're redeemed by the incorruptible Word of God. I'm not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with what am I? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. How much sore punishment suppose ye shall be, he be thought worthy, who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing. Let that be a warning. In Acts 20, 28 through 31, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Jesus Christ purchased the church with his own blood. Here's the miraculous thing. Jesus ascended into heaven, applied his blood to the heavenly, in the holy of holies in heaven, on that heavenly true mercy seat, so that now for the next, who knows how long, we're in 2021 right now. We're in what they call the church age. That any sinner that comes to God the way God says to come can now have the boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies. Why? Because that blood, that incorruptible blood, that holy blood was applied to the heavenly mercy seat and it will be there forever as a testimony for me and for you, and for anybody after I'm gone that trusts Jesus as their Savior, that blood is for them too, because they're part of the church of God. And that is such an exciting story and, and truth and fulfillment of, of the Old Testament and the New, and it's better. It's better. Be excited about it. Tell the whole story of Jesus a lot of the songwriters have it right. 
if we sing all the verses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we call